and we're here in Thessaloniki at the Nanotechnology Conference. And who are you? Hi, Nicolas. Nice to meet you. I'm Antigone Alexandru. Uh, I will be presenting a, a, a talk, an invited talk tomorrow uh, on ultra sensitive in vitro diagnostics. So, what does that mean? So, in vitro diagnostics is, uh, to put it in a simple way, is what you do when you get a blood sample uh, and, and then you use that blood sample to detect different molecules inside the blood sample and to determine if you have uh, certain different types of disease. So what we are doing is doing the same thing, only we can do it in a much more sensitive way. Uh, something like 1,000 more sensitive than standard techniques that are used in a uh, medical analysis lab. So now, uh, uh, people use a lot of those glucose meters or something like that, but there's some other things people do also that are much more advanced, like when they do blood tests, right? Yes, exactly. And th when they do the blood test, you have a technology potentially to do much more detailed. Exactly. For example, there are cytokines which are involved in uh, inflama inflammatory diseases and they are so-called biomarkers because they sort of tell you if the disease is there or not. And in many cases, these biomarkers are the current technology is not able to detect them with high enough sensitivity. So the concentrations are there, but they are too low to be detected. And what we propose with our nanoparticle-based technology is to be able to detect these biomarkers, these cytokines, uh, which currently it's not possible to detect them unless you have extremely sophisticated technology. So um, what do you show here? Okay, so this is, uh, explains our technology. Uh, it's similar to the uh, so-called ELISA technology. What you do is you have antibodies on a surface. Then you, put your, you incubate your sample, your, your surface here with the antibodies. You incubate it with uh, the blood sample, which contains different kinds of molecules, which are shown here with different shapes and different colors. Then you rinse, and let's say you want to detect a, a cytokine indicative of inflammation. So let's say this is a cytokine. There is a few in, this, uh, so in your blood sample, and so it is recognized by these antibodies which uh, capture the biomarker. And then you can come and reveal the presence of this biomarker, this uh, green molecule, by another antibody which will recognize a different part of the same molecule, which is called a capture antibody. Now what you need is a, a sort of probe to be able to detect the fact that the antibody has bound and the fact that this biomarker is there or was there in your blood sample. And this is where our technology enters. Um, usually people use um, techniques that are not very sensitive, but what we propose is to use these uh, lanthanide uh, ion-based uh, oxide nanoparticles, which are extremely bright, extremely photostable, and they give you the possibility to have a very high signal-to-noise ratio so that you can detect very low concentrations. So if we, I show you the next slide, this is what you can typically do. There is a notion in, in this field, is the limit of detection. Limit of detection is the lowest concentration you can detect of this given molecule, this given biomarker. And uh, if you use a standard technique that gives you a, a low signal, if the signal is below this limit of detection, you cannot detect the concentration you're interested in. But in our case, what we do, we have a huge increase of the signal due to the very bright uh, probes, uh, uh, luminescence-emitting, light-emitting probes that we have, that emission that we excite with a laser. And the signal becomes now, in our case, with our technology, much higher than this limit of detection level. And so the, even a very low concentration becomes detectable. So right now there are um, uh, clinical uh, studies 
uh, we use samples and they, they do the measurements and for certain cytokines, the 90% of the samples, uh, they measure uh, nothing. That is, they measure a value that is below the threshold. So they don't know if there is no, uh, s none of the specific cytokine or if it's the concentration is just too low to detect. And with our technology, we will be able now to uh, detect these concentrations and really be able to say if there is some uh, concentration there or not. And, and uh, in particular, we will be able to detect a combination of biomarkers. And, and in that case, current molecules that are known to be representative of a disease uh, cannot be used as biomarkers because their concentrations are too low. But now we will be able with this technique, which uh, from our laboratory we have commercialized them with a startup that uh, we co-founded with uh, Max Richley uh, called Lumedix. We will be able to bring new biomarkers to to the to the market because currently biomarkers are there, but we cannot detect them. If we are able to detect them, there will be new ways of detecting disease. More early, so earlier detection means uh, better uh, prognostics for the disease because if you can detect it earlier, you can uh, treat it earlier. And so there is a huge, uh, a huge uh, impact that we expect to have with this uh, technology. Uh, so, so these bright dots right here, is it like a? new kind of invention that you were able to do this so it's based on established science that's an old way of doing things or well actually we've been working on this technology with a colleague Thierry Gacoin it's uh, also uh, working at the Col Polytechnique my institution in uh, Palaiso near Paris uh, so in my lab and in his lab we have been working on these nanoparticles for about 15 to 20 years now but we've been working for more uh, uh, for on more uh, basic applications, like how to label single molecules in the cell membrane and how to track them and see how they, they diffuse inside the cell membrane and how they are confined in certain cases and how that influences the, the, the functioning of the cells. And then at some point we realized that these very, these, the properties of these particles, the fact that they are synthesized easily, they are synthesized in water, uh, the fact that they are um, uh, very photostable and very stable in dispersion, so they don't aggregate. All these, uh, all these uh, properties make them very good candidates for this present application to detect biomarkers in blood or in other uh, human urine samples, for example. And so, uh, yes. So how far is this from the market? Actually, this uh, startup, Lumedix, that uh, we co-founded, uh, started last year, uh, was uh, created last year in July 2018. And uh, we're currently working on the industrialization of the technology. And hopefully by next year, there will be products in the market. And what are the other things you're working on? You're working on many things or? Well, actually we're working with, with my team together with my colleagues at Rick Bouzid. We have a team uh, that is, and also Nicolas Olivier, we have a team at the Laboratory of uh, Optics and Biosciences in Ecole Polytechnique which is working on, let's say, as I mentioned earlier, understanding cell function and also uh, being able to detect, and uh, maybe I can show you another slide, being able to detect, uh, for example, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, well, people used to use it to remove nail polish. Now you don't do it anymore because it's uh, a bit toxic. Not highly toxic, but you have less toxic. Uh, uh, solvents that you can use now. Yeah, it's just no problem. Uh, oh, maybe you can yeah. tell them to speak okay. a bit less loudly. Yeah, that's that's okay. It's just coming right here. Yeah. Oh. So, and uh, and what was known for a long time is that hydrogen peroxide 
uh, is used by immune cells to kill bacteria. So it's uh, bactericidal activity. And you also use it to in cleaning uh, solutions at home sometimes. Uh, and uh, so what has been uh, found out more recently is that this molecule, hydrogen peroxide, uh, is actually also present not only as a toxic molecule, but it's also present in very low concentrations, in a very localized manner in time and space, and is uh, like a, it's, it has a role of a signaling molecule. Now, what is signaling for a cell? Signaling is well, cells need to communicate with each other, and they need to communicate with the external environment. So. There is a signal, there is a molecule coming from uh, the outside. It's detected by so-called receptors on the cell membrane. And then there is a transmission of signal uh, so that the receptor's role is to detect the, the signal, detect the signaling molecule, and then tell the cell to do something in response to that. For example, if you have uh, uh, vascular cells, muscular, muscular vas uh, vascular cells. What they, uh, what their role is, is to contract, for example, in response to certain signals. So, if it detects, uh, if this, this, these uh, uh, vascular smooth muscle cells, if they detect uh, a molecule called endothelin, this is the signal for the cell to contract. And so, the, the cell has a machinery to. Uh, transform this outside signal into a cellular response, which can be, in this case, contraction or migration or differentiation or uh, apoptosis. And, and so, and for that, there is an intermediate molecule, which is like a, what it is called, uh, it has a signaling, cell has a signaling machinery. And there is an intermediate molecule. In, in our case, it's also hydrogen peroxide. And it, it, it's involved in the signaling cascade of detecting the signal f from detecting the signal all the way to creating the cell response. And in the middle, there is this hydrogen peroxide. And what we do is try to understand how this signaling pathway works by detecting this hydrogen peroxide in a very efficient way. Quantitatively, we can measure concentrations and resolve in time and in space. And actually, it turns out that we use the very same nanoparticles that I mentioned before for ultra-sensitive detection. We use these very same particles in a very, in a, in a somewhat different uh, situation and the conditions. To detect this, uh, to detect with, and so we have a nano sensor. Before we had a label, now we have a nano sensor. And uh, maybe I can show you a slide on this. Right. I think. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can show you how, for example. Is this, is this something that has to do with blood samples also, or where do you do this? Uh, actually, we do that in cells, and that's for basic research. So we want to understand what the concentrations of the signaling molecule, what the involved concentrations are, and what the time dynamics is. Because we have been able to show with our sensors that the dynamics is different. For example, uh, here is one example. Depending if, okay, here is our molecule that activates the receptor, and then this receptor leads to production of hydrogen peroxide, this signaling molecule that I was mentioning before. And depending on the type of the stimulation of the cell, this is a uh, molecule inducing to contraction, and here this is a molecule, platelet-derived growth factor that induces migration. And you can see here that the time scale, the dynamics, the time dynamics is very different between these two stimulations. So this, this oops, sorry, no uh, the, the secondary messenger that we use, that the cell uses, is the same hydrogen peroxide, but the time dynamics is different. 
and the concentration is similar, but the time dynamics is different. And we are, thanks to this uh, nano sensor uh, uh, based on europium ions, we were the first to be able to detect this. And now the next step. So what, what do you detect? What do you? So where we, does, we were. Uh, what can yeah, you do? What we detect? Uh, well, we detect as before the luminescence of these nanoparticles. The only difference is that before we reduce them. So we remove electrons and then this molecule has oxidative properties. Sorry, we, we, we add electrons and this molecule has oxidative properties. So it removes electrons of the, from the nanoparticles. So we, when we add electrons, I don't show it here, but what happens is that the luminescence signal decreases. Then we stimulate the cell and then hydrogen peroxide is produced. Here are the nanoparticles we, oops, I'm sorry, which we have managed to put inside the cell by relatively standard technique. And here is the white light image of the cell and here are the nanoparticles emitting signal luminescence inside the cell. So we follow the luminescence of one single nanoparticle. So, the luminescence goes down when we add electrons, and then when we stimulate the cell, we produce this signaling molecule. And then it oxidizes the nanoparticles back to their initial state, and then we have a rise in luminescence. And from this rise, we can extract very precisely, quantitatively, and time and space resolve. Time resolve, because you can see we can measure the concentration of hydrogen peroxide as a function of time but we can also measure locally because each nanoparticle here, each single nanoparticle that you can visualize with a high performance uh, luminescence microscope gives you the information of the hydrogen peroxide in the very specific location of the cell where the nanoparticle is located. So we have time resolution, space resolution, and quantitative information. So what could this possibly uh, help with in the future? Okay, so what I've been saying is more trying to understand how the cells work, but well, it's one very important issue in basic science is you never know what application it will lead to. So it's very important to have basic science if you want to have applied science later down on the way. And so here is the application. And this is relevant to many different uh, materials, many different particles? Actually, actually, for now, this is the only nanoparticle that we have identified that uh, has all these uh, multiple properties, localized uh, and time resolve detection and uh, quantitative detection. Uh, other nanosensors uh, don't have all these uh, combination, this combination of, of uh, uh, properties. And the next thing, so I've told you, this is what we call physiological signaling, what happens when the hell is healthy. But then this process can get deregulated, and then you get uh, deregulated hydrogen peroxide production, you get what we call oxidative stress. You probably heard about that. In the, it's often mentioned in uh, everyday life about uh, oxidative stress, and you get to get to have to use antioxidant to remove the oxidative stress. It has entered the everyday commercials, and and then you can have if you have deregulation of this hydrogen peroxide production. You can have neurodegenerative diseases, you can have inflammation, chronic inflammation which is related to cancer, and uh, many diseases which are related to inflammation like diabetes, or uh, as I said, neurodegenerative diseases. And so the next step is to try to do this detection in, uh, in vivo, in vivo meaning in living organisms. So we start with mice. And uh, so this has not been published yet, but we, what we did was, of course, there is an ethical committee that validated this uh, research program uh, beforehand. We did that with uh, Gustave Roussy, which is a hospital, which is uh, one of the most uh, well-known cancer uh, hospitals and research centers in France and in Europe. And what we do is we have a mouse model of inflammation. So we have, uh, we inject the particles in the mouse ear, and then we apply a molecule uh, called methyl salicylate 
which induces inflammation of the ear. Actually, it's uh, what also uh, some uh, people use in sports to heat up their muscles. <laughs> um, okay, in this case, you generate an inflammation. And here, okay, we, ha we can see here in this uh, image, you can see the particles, the emission of the particles that have been injected in the mouse here. And then when you do this, okay, first we check that we indeed have an inflammation uh, with other standard techniques. I will skip this part. And then, as I showed you here, this is the signal of the nanoparticles. So I will start the movie now. And uh, when I start the movie, you will see in the beginning, nothing happens. The signal, the luminescent signal, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, just go back. Go back. Yeah. It's not playing right. Wait. Ah, yes. So in the beginning, nothing happens. Then, okay, I will go back because it's it goes a bit fast. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So in the beginning nothing happens then we apply the in inductant of inflammation so that's when we the mouse here shifts a bit and then if we wait a little we see the increase of the signal that i told you which reflects the production of hydrogen peroxide and other oxidant molecules so here again it's one of the first measurements of this uh, oxidative uh, response which is a pathological condition, especially if it becomes chronic. And so we have been able to uh, measure as a function of time and for different mouse ears, the increase of signal and how it is, and from that we can extract the production of hydrogen peroxide. So if you remember what I showed you before, here the signal is I didn't show it actually, but the signal here is much higher than before because the concentrations and the signal, related signals for a physiological mechanism is much lower. Here we have a pathological mechanism or uh, it's, it's an inflammation, it's a reaction of the body to this uh, application of an external molecule. And we have a higher signal, higher production of hydrogen peroxide. So, Ideally, we would like in the long term to be able to do this in humans, but we, this will still require some years of work <laughs> to come. And so these signals and detecting those signals can be useful for many things? For Yes, as I mentioned, there are several pathologies uh, and it, there are many pathologies where inflammation is involved. Cardiovascular disease is uh, also in, involves as an inflammatory response neurodegenerative diseases, uh, cancer, many cancer types are related to chronic inflammation, like, uh, for example, the uh, gastric cancer comes from uh, uh, ulcers, an ulcer comes uh, from um, um, helicobacter uh, pylori bacterium, it creates ulcers, it creates a chronic inflammation, and if nothing is done, yeah the chronic inflammation uh, can turn into cancer. So all these diseases, it's important for all these diseases, it's important to be able to measure as many parameters as possible of the disease, to be able to do what is called precision or personalized medicine. Because, okay, currently you measure one or two biomarkers, but if you can also measure what is the concentration of hydrogen peroxide for a certain patient, and how that correlates with the, the severity of the cancer or with the metastatic activity of the cancer, or you can correlate it, this is things that we hope to do in the future, how it correlates uh, with the efficacy of a certain uh, pharmaceutical treatment. So this tool, measuring the reactive oxygen species that are produced, uh, of which one of the main ones, is, main ones is the hydrogen peroxide, this can give a viable new parameter for a huge number of pathological situations. So you can get an injection of something and then it, all the, the, the cancer cells will light up, or how does it work? Well, uh, 
we are currently starting to work on that. We want to avoid injecting, we want to avoid injecting the nanoparticles in the human body because there are always toxicity issues. So we would like to be able to just introduce the particles, do the measurement, and then remove them. So maybe in the next conference, I can uh, tell you more about this. And you're in <laughs> Paris, right? Yes, I work in uh, south of Paris uh, at the Ecole Polytechnique, which has now merged with uh, four other institutions to form the Institut Polytechnique de Paris. And many students in your group, or how does it work? Yeah, we, we are three permanent researchers, uh, one technical staff and uh, graduate students, postdocs, and uh, undergraduate students, so typically a group of about 10 people, but we are a part of a bigger lab with 50, 60 people, uh, the laboratory for optics and biosciences. And our team is called uh, Nano Imaging. And, um, Nano, nanotechnology is a big deal. Yes, nano imaging and quantitative biology. Uh, yes, uh, all these nano tools are now almost everywhere in all aspects of, of life. And of course, we have to make sure that we use them only where they are really necessary so that the public uh, does not develop. Uh, Nano addiction? Uh, not nano addiction, but uh, an apprehension of these technologies. In some cases, they are used in, in um, sunscreens, for example. In some cases, they are not really necessary. So scientists have to be really careful to, in, in terms with interaction with society, have to be justify why we use the nanoparticles and that we use them only when they are really necessary. Because, of course, there are also uh, human toxicity issues, but also toxicity issues to the environment if they are used at a massive scale. And if uh, they are released in the environment, you can have issues like we have today with plastic. Maybe if we don't pay attention, we'll have similar issues with nanoparticles. So hopefully not. But uh, the scientists in this field have to be very cautious about uh, issues like that. And here, so you'll have a presentation about this tomorrow. And do you have not lo lots of networking with people from the nanotech? Yes, this is really a great occasion to meet uh, very exciting people in different fields. In my field of nano medicine and nanobiology, uh, but also to see some very exciting plenary talks on other fields of, of nanosciences. So I'm really delighted to be here and I thank the organizers for inviting me.